English, Espanol, Vanos Enigma. Uh, watching one video of World Crypto Network. Um, and the video is called um, The Bitcoin Group Number 86. Justo estaba mirando un video de World Crypto Network. Mm, video se llama Bitcoin Group. Numero 86. Actually, I want co want to comment three um, things on this video. Quiero hacer tres comentarios a este video. First, I liked what Tone Base said to use cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin to use for charity organizations to make them more transparent. En primer lugar, me gustó lo que dijo Tone Vase uh, de usar criptomonedas como Bitcoin para organizaciones de para donaciones de caridad para ayudar a gente de una forma más transparente and especially that topic of privacy not everybody likes that um, the bank account and government has access to the information to which organization you are donating money. Y el tema de la privacidad, que no todo el mundo le gusta, que si cuando donan dinero pa que el gobierno tiene acceso a la información a qué organización van a donar dinero. Maybe later I'll paste a part of that video when Tone Vase speaks. Tal vez más tarde voy a pegar una parte del video cuando habla Tone Vase. The second thing I wanted to comment is uh, when I watched Tone Vase uh, talking I saw that he was wearing a t-shirt of uh, that mark Affliction. En segundo lugar, quería comentar que cuando estaba viendo ese video vi que Tom Weiss estaba tenía puesto una camiseta de la marca Affliction, Affliction. And just some days or weeks uh, before I saw um, one video on YouTube commenting on the designs of affliction. Y justo hace unos días o semanas he visto un video en YouTube que alguien estaba comentando en los diseños de la marca Affliction. I'm just going for a walk, but if I remember well, um, the name of the channel is We Are All Inventions. Si recuerdo bien el nombre del canal de YouTube, is um, we are all inventions. Somos todos invenciones traducidos. Sorry, just one side comment. <laughs> just thinking of Homer Simpson. I think uh, someone he said, "Oh, my memory is fizzy." <laughs> but I think I remember correctly. I just saw mo motorcycles passing by. Justo un comentario al lado que dice Homer Simpson, uh, mi memoria es 
eh, fisi, como se dice en español, es como <ríe> de la burbuja en la cerveza. <ríe> Beer. Duff. <ríe> And if I remember correctly, um, the title of that video or two videos are um, Masonic Art. Uh, I'm referring to Freemason. Free Masonic Art proves they know about Flat Earth. Si recuerdo bien, el título del nombre es, como he dicho en español, voy a traducir en, en inglés, voy a traducir en español, eh, que sí que la, el arte masónico de uh, Freemasons uh, prueba que saben de la tierra plana. Hashtag let's talk FE. If I think a little further in these designs of affliction, I'm thinking I have several Twitter accounts. I have a um, long time I'm planning to create videos. Soul Confiscator! And um, the Twitter account. Soul Trade Game. <laughs> Cuando sigo pensando en esa dirección de, de los diseños de Affliction, uh, estoy pensando en mis. Tengo varias cuentas de Twitter, entre ellos el, la cuenta de Twitter Soul Confiscator, que en español es Confiscator de Almas. And in relation to that, um, the Soul Trade game is a juego de negocios de almas. <laughs> long, long, yeah, I didn't, didn't translate it in Spanish. Uh, mucho tiempo ya tengo planeado de crear videos del tema. Uh, soul Confiscator, the uh, actor, uh, Soul Confiscator, <laughs> Mr. Burns of Simpsons, Soul Extraction Center, or Institute, what is it called? Actually, they didn't show that in here in Spanish. Oh, anyway, my three TVs got broken. Now I have only YouTube, but it doesn't matter. I can watch some things. Uh, they haven't shown this episode of Sword Instruction Institute. Maybe I should look for that. Anyway, mm, such a long to-do list. Mis tres televisiones al final se rompieron. Que ahora solo tengo YouTube. No hay igual. Si quiero puedo también. No quiero gastar dinero en comprar más putas televisiones. Televisión quiere. Anyway, anyway it means like television. No television. Television. Contar una visión. Todavía no he enseñado ese episodio de Soul Extraction Institute. Devil's Advocate. One hashtag I have in my Twitter account. Soul Confiscator. Uh, quiere decir como abogado del diablo. <laughs> United Nations, Naciones Unidas, has tried you, tried to show you Flat Earth in their flag, in their symbol, in their map, but you have potatoes in front of your eyes. Las Naciones Unidas han intentado de enseñarte en 
su símbolo de la bandera, el mapa de la tierra plana. Pero tú tienes tomates delante de, de tus ojos y no es solo en el mapa de Naciones Unidas, hay muchas más eh, símbolos de, por ejemplo, el um, símbolo en la World Health Organization, eh, ahí, they have the same symbol, symbol of the flat map. Um, tienen el mismo símbolo de la tierra plana, en su símbolo de la bandera, el símbolo de Organización Mundial de Salud. World Health Organization. And with the serpent around the stick of Moses. Remember the Bible when the serpents converted into stick, but in the end, the serpents of the Pharaoh ate the serpents, sorry, sorry, <laughs> the serpents of Moses devoured the serpents of the Pharaoh. He was able to commit the same magic trick, but in the end, his serpents lost. Recuerda en la Biblia cuando Moses convirtió el bastón en serpiente y luego el faraón hizo el mismo milagro, pero luego la serpiente de Moisés comió la serpiente de faraón. I think I forgot to translate in Spanish in that symbol of no. Confusing the languages. Uh, creo que se me olvidó de traducir en español que sí, en el símbolo de la uh, Organización Mundial de Salud hay también ese bastón y con la serpiente alrededor. Y por eso he dicho esa uh, analogía de Oasis con la serpiente. The third thing I wanted to comment is um, in about minute 48 of that same video. La tercera cosa que quería comentar es en la, el, me parece, es minuto 48 del mismo video. I saw that happen uh, several times before, but this time I want to mention it because it's a little funny. Ya lo he visto que pasó ya varias veces, pero esta vez quiero mencionarlo porque es gracioso. Normally in this Google Hangouts, uh, the camera uh, focus automatically the person who is speaking. But sometimes it doesn't function correctly, like in, I think, minute 48, uh, when <laughs> Theo Goodman was focused but although he was not speaking and by chance he oh, he dared to yawn how do you dare to yawn <laughs> maybe later I'll paste that or maybe now first I'll paste that and later I'll paste the other thing <laughs> because it's just short bueno normalmente um, la cámara um, enseña a la persona que está hablando en los uh, Google Hangouts uh, lo enseña automáticamente pero a veces no funciona así que por ejemplo esta vez uh, más tarde voy a pegarlo parece minuto 48 a uh, Theo Gottman 
estaba en la cámara aunque él no estaba hablando ¿Y ¿Cómo se atreve de bostezar? <risa> es gracioso, por eso eh, voy a pegarlo a continuación. But anyway, I want to draw the attention to it's that it's a problem in Google Hangout which should be solved. Um, it's I like to speak. Uh, as challenge uh, if I mention any problem a challenge, a problem to solve en realidad solo quiero traer la atención a que es un problema de Google Hangout que no es la primera vez que pasa y que es un reto para solucionar I have one Ether, you have two. We each get, uh, you know, 10% of our holdings or whatever it is. Um, this has failed repeatedly in the altcoin space already. And on a tone, vase, your thoughts on the Chris Ellis fundraiser? No, I, I think Bitcoin will um, change fundraising in the future, especially for things like this. I don't know if you saw me put my phone up. Uh, it really goes well for people that are kind of lazy, including myself. I mean, I knew this campaign was happening, but I didn't get around to scanning the QR code until just now being on the show. Um, I was also out of the country for a little bit. And it's just amazingly convenient. And best of all, it's, um, it's KYC free. And uh, those that have heard me speak for a while now and on these shows, I'm all about financial privacy. It's, it's the most important thing to me. Um, so anytime there is uh, one of these uh, fundraisers for money, I, I think it's great because you can contribute without, um, if, you, if you want people to know who you are, you can make it known who you are. But if you don't, you don't. It leaves everything up to the user. Um, just a few other comments I wanted to say on this as far as spending goes. Um, if Chris wants to uh, make a statement with this, and I hope Chris is listening, uh, what you can do is I see Bitcoin as being the future of all charity financing, mostly because all the transactions are public on the blockchain. If you have a public charity, I just I find it so frustrating that you have to you need government permission to be a nonprofit organization. I, I, I just find that crazy and all the paperwork and all the lawyers, and then you have to prove that you are nonprofit. I really think this is one of the blockchain applications. Is that you want to be a nonprofit? Great. Run everything through Bitcoin and everything through the blockchain and call yourself a nonprofit. And if anybody wants to question it, go find a developer, show them all your QR codes, and there you go. Everything I spend, everything documented, every time you do a Bitcoin transaction, you put a note exactly what it was. Uh, one day, if the Bitcoin blockchain is used as a notary service, you take a picture of all the receipts and you hash. Uh, you know, that, that picture in, I mean, again, that's, uh, that's way into the future, but that's the idea. To me, the future of charitable organizations for nonprofit is going to take government completely out of it and run it through the blockchain. And things like this are proof because Chris is a friend of ours and we know him and we believe, and we know that he's sick and we believe him, but people on the other side of the world can't prove that he's sick. Uh, but this is a way if all your payments go through Bitcoin, and you can prove that everything you've collected is actually going uh, to treat you. It just creates a lot more trust for sending money because I don't, I don't give money to charities. I don't trust any of them. I don't care if they say they're nonprofit. I know half that money goes to the ones that are collecting for it anyway. Um, so I think there is a lot of things Bitcoin can do uh, for charities and collections. I uh, also wanted to comment, somebody talked about clean food and clean air. Oh, that is absolutely true. I'm a big believer in eating clean food. I'm at the farmer's markets every weekend, even living in New York City. Um, it kind of sucks having to always find uh, up at like 8 in the morning on a Saturday just so you can get eggs because they sell out so quick. Um, and also environment. Um, every time I leave New York, I just feel so much better. I was just in the Dominican Republic, and I wake up in the morning, and I breathe better over there than here. Um, I'll be in Mexico next week. It'll probably be the same thing. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm no longer a big fan of these metropolitan cities, London, New York, LA. Uh, I, I really like the clean air in some of the other countries or even outside the major cities and major countries. 
Now this exit question. I have one ether, you have two. We each get uh, you know, 10% of our holdings or whatever it is. Um, Accents. I mean, first of all, the SEC comment you mentioned. Um, you're talking about a United States financial organization. There's a very specific reason why Vitalik moved the company to Switzerland before the crowd sale. They have very specific digital equity laws that they took advantage of. So on the selling side, I don't think they have anything at all to worry about. Uh, as far as the buyers, maybe it, I don't know how that works. I'm not, I'm really not an expert at that, but I do know that in Switzerland they were, they had a cadre of lawyers before they did their crowd sale. So I'm not concerned about the, the Ethereum sort of foundation being in trouble because of the crowd sale. Um, now, you mentioned um, the team itself, uh, and that is the reason why I've been pretty skeptical since the beginning. Um, Vitalik is extremely young. As you mentioned, he doesn't know anything at all about economics and probably also nothing about game theory. And he, the proof of stake thing is definitely an issue. I mean, um, Ethereum has as its goal, we want to move away from proof of work because it's waste wasteful. Um, obviously, it's, you're actually crunching numbers, but it, because they think, because the competitive side, they think that the crunching isn't serving any purpose but the competition and is therefore wasteful, which is, you know, that's an opinion. Um, now, to, to leap from that to say, we're going to make proof of stake work. Now, for those listeners who don't know what that is, proof of stake is when um, instead of the coins, uh, you know, the, new, the newly created cryptocurrency being distributed to miners who are crunching numbers and get sort of paid for it with new currency, instead, if you have a balance, then you get paid possibly in proportion to your balance. So I have one ether, you have two, we each get, uh, you know, 10% of our holdings or whatever it is. Um, this has failed repeatedly in the altcoin space already, and on a on a, a theoretical level too, has not really passed muster with um, experts in the field, as far as I'm aware. I'm not saying it's impossible because I mean, I tend to think that anything that has digital, uh, where you're making a digital scarcity paradigm, you're generally going to need something else that's also genuinely scarce in order to tie it to. But I totally could be wrong about that. We're definitely not there yet, and recently I heard Vinay Gupta, who's an amazing thinker. I really um, just love, you know, Vinay's whole vibe, and he is the um, community manager for Ethereum for the, for the foundation. He's got a job. They employ him. He does these incredible talks where he, uh, you know, really, really made the tie between databases, networks, and blockchains, and, you know, show that, okay, we had databases, we had networks, but they didn't work together until, we, until now we have the blockchain. But he has a very strong faith. They call it scalability in the Ethereum space. He has a very strong um, faith that we'll be able to switch to a proof of stake paradigm within two years. Now, I don't know the details, but it seems very optimistic. If he's speaking from his gut, I'll speak from mine. My gut says if we ever find it, it's going to take another generation. So P PGP, Bitcoin, proof of stake, maybe something like that. But that's just conjecture. Certainly, these guys have this plan down the road, and that was one of the reasons why. I also, I mean, as interesting, I've been following the Ethereum story since the start and found it totally fascinating to have a Turing complete. Smart contract programming language built into the base level of the cryptocurrency is a really interesting idea. I love it, but um, this whole obsession with proof of stake seemed very unhealthy. And then um, this, uh, what happened with the crowd sale, of course, was they rose it all during the peak of the Bitcoin bubble, 15 million, and held it 100% in Bitcoin, leaving them with 4 million at the end. And the same roadmap, though, and the same amount of development required. And so then, of course, when the money ran out, the projects, some of the projects had to had to be left beside, and um, I just saw, wow, this guy has no experience running a business, he has no experience running a coding thing, as intelligent as he is, this is a risk, very risky bet. I've been following it closely since then, and Counterparty forked the Ethereum uh, Serpent um, smart contract um, uh, coding language in a weekend. Uh, they're able to do nearly everything that Ethereum can on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, put it together in a few hours. So that's the danger of open source, you know, like as Theo pointed out, these companies are using Serpent, which is undoubtedly a useful language. It doesn't have anything at all to do with the Ether token. Um, on the Thomas's point about making the smart contracts expensive with the Ether coin, I don't necessarily buy into that. With divisibility, I think it'll still be ridiculously cheap. It'll still make sense, but I don't see how it would make more sense to use Ethereum when you have a more secure blockchain with Bitcoin. However, that is the point that I'm really trying to figure out now, which is... Um, the internal versus external debate. In other words, the base layer of Bitcoin is just this, maybe you could call it a settlement layer. It's the pure P2P um, value transfer layer. And then counterparty or, or a smart contract platform would live on top of it. That would be an external system. Uh, whereas the Ethereum network joins them together. It's an internal smart contract network. So I think that if there's some magical sauce that makes the internal smart contract system a way better, more efficient something or other, then it's conceivable that Ethereum could grab a toehold in the industry. Um, and Tone, I believe you made some uh, ill-informed comments about smart contracts. I think that the hype is way premature, but the potential of the smart contract um, software application is as big or bigger than the pure 
value transfer. It's enormously, it has so much potential to transform huge swaths of our society in, in totally unforeseeable ways. It's incredibly powerful. The conflict between legality or you know, legal contracts that are between people with human beings and ink on paper and smart contracts, it's a very important question. That does not invalidate the potential of smart contracts just because you're, you're, there's going to be some conflict there. The main thing to keep in mind is smart contracts are at their most powerful and most accurately understood when you see them as a purely software and purely crypto related phenomenon. For example, you have a totally um, cryptographically private, secure smart contract between two parties or two or more parties on a blockchain, totally hashed, totally anonymous. It's sitting there and it's completely self-contained. This smart contract is, is, it has certain uh, you know, inputs. Let's say the inputs that, that you know, are merely a clock, you know, just a certain block size, boom, something happens. The less you depend on the outside world for that smart contract, the more powerful it is. So those type of smart contracts are not going to, you, you can try to go to a court, but nobody's going to, it's not enforceable. So that's where the power of the courts and the social um, government style contracts ends and the software smart contract begins. So these self-contained software entities have extreme power. It's going to take several years before they're even used in a rudimentary way, I feel. Um, you know, other than just really, really basic ones in counterparty and, and Ethereum to, sort of for testing and for smaller amounts, but the potential is huge. And those questions about the conflict between um, legal contracts and smart contracts will be raised and they'll be dealt with. Um, and it will be a really interesting conflict. And I'm sure that, you know, there will be a lot of overlap too. And where you have overlap there, of course, you'll have major problems. Um, and Theo, the way to connect a private blockchain and a public blockchain is merely to take a hash of the private blockchain state and pop it into one single very cheap transaction for one Satoshi, for example, in Bitcoin. There, there you've connected it. It takes yeah. one, you mean one like hash and one transaction. Yeah, that's yeah. how you do it. That's what they mean, yeah. I'm assuming. Um, yeah. That doesn't well, make any that's of their claims for you know actual business models anymore valid, however. Yeah, well, I still have to trust the, the private one, but yeah, whatever. Okay, you could connect it. Okay, anyway, as a All final right. uh, way, I, I have something to say. Um, you know, I managed to write the entire world crypto network in three lines of serpent code so uh you know just to show you the power of ethereum uh with that and uh we've bundled everything into a smart contract so i'll be releasing that on my github uh tomorrow and you can check it out I i'm just glad we had someone that's excited and interested in ethereum on the show so that we can be fair and balanced and we can tell all the critics but we had that one guy who liked it Okay, exit no, question. No, no, no. I don't say I like it. I mean, I, I'm very yeah. doubtful about this token. That's yeah. 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 This is obviously, it's a parabolic rise. This is obviously a bubble. I mean, when it, when it pops, though, it might be worth it to grab some. I don't know. All right, let me, let me just jump right in there real quick. Just, just two comments on what uh, Gabe said. All right, so Gabe, so I will, um, I will agree with you what you said at the end about the actual smart contract. Um, and I, I agree with that. I, I actually do. I think there is a future for smart contract contracts, but I think it's years away. I mean, the entire contract the mentality I mean, look we're, bitcoin has been around for seven years and what maybe a fraction of one percent of the world population is comfortable with it maybe a fraction of one percent even if someone understands what it is i think smart contracts are still a long way away and then we're talking we have companies like bitnation that want to put government on the blockchain i mean that's a that's a millennium away i mean we're talking like a hundred plus years for something for, for something like that to be like people to be comfortable with so we're long away and again my problem is not with the concept of what ethereum is doing my problem is um, uh, the token, the pre-mined token. I mean, that, that they use to just like pay themselves. Uh, that's my problem. And the fact that it's like being run like a company and they have like what, COOs and marketing people. And, and, and this is why it took Bitcoin so long. It doesn't have any of that. There's nobody running it like a company. And uh, clearly they had nobody there that understands finance, which is why they completely lost all that money they made in the crowd sale. Uh, and I have to disagree with you on the laws in Switzerland. I mean, they, they think they got around the law, but I look, Kim.com never even had a visa to come to the United States, not to mention uh, set his foot in it. And they just showed up in New Zealand, put him in a helicopter and dragged him into the U.S. And he'll probably end up spending a decent amount of time in a U.S. jail. The United States doesn't give a shit about Switzerland. They don't care about their finance, their security laws. If they want to go after the Ethereum people, they'll go after the Ethereum people. It's uh, I, I don't buy that at all. And clearly they knew it was illegal. That's why they moved to Switzerland for the crowd sale to begin with. What does that tell you? I mean, the, the world doesn't know this? Oh, and somebody sent me a video of Gavin Wood admitting that he's now being investigated for, um, uh, what do you call it, being a money transmitter just because he sold Bitcoins on local Bitcoin and had people put that money into his bank account. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. Anyone that did that. Look, I love Bitcoin. I want to spread Bitcoin. I want everyone to have it. I want everyone to understand what it is. It is uh, It will be the only asset that cannot be confiscated. But if you acquire it the wrong way, and the wrong way to acquire Bitcoin is by flashing who you are at any point during the transaction, I, I'm a little worried for you, especially if you have a US passport. 
Uh, and just the mere fact that these guys were doing that and then they started Ethereum and uh, they're public people. I mean, Satoshi is a mystery for a reason, not because he wants to be God, because he knows he would already be in prison. And nobody else seems to understand that. I mean, to them, fame is more important. Look, we're all public figures as well. But if someone can uh, trace a single Bitcoin transaction of mine to my you know, identity through um, with a digital signature, I would be impressed because I don't believe that's how Bitcoin was meant to be used. And anyone that's using it like that, uh, with a U.S. passport especially, uh, needs to be real careful. I Just my honest opinion. We've got one more chance to get in trouble with the exit question. <laughs> exit question. The Ethereum rally has reached the top. Or will it continue? Tone Vays. I'm going to say it's going to continue because every time I say it's at the top is in and it's imminent, it just triples. Um, so no, Ethereum is going gonna, is gonna to come very close to Aurora coin. I think it's going to just miss it. So look up the all-time high price for Aurora coin. I believe it was $100 on the dot. So I'm thinking Ethereum will go to about $99.90. Oh man, I don't want to have to buy some. Uh, Theo Goodman, tell us some news about Ethereum. Okay, it's at the top. Uh, not, it seems to be there's plenty of buyers already here. And like I said, on, on the subreddits, You'll see people, I'm all in Ethereum now. So whenever that gets all burned out and people are tired of, are finished, you know, changing their Bitcoin stash into Ethereum, then we might start to see it go down a little. But I don't know. It doesn't look like it right now. It, you know, I thought today maybe it's going to go down, but uh, it didn't really go down that much. So let's see what happens. Now, okay, Aurora coin. Yeah, all right. I don't know what the volume was like on that and everything. That's nice, but... You know, the I think the so-called consensus that I've gotten from the the Ether subreddits is uh, $10 is the target. But guys, you're setting the target way too low. What are you doing? I mean, you guys are supposed to be way better than Litecoin. Litecoin was $49 on BDCE. I mean, come on. You've got to top Litecoin in order to be legit. Well, and everyone remember the lesson of Litecoin. We were all waiting for $50 to sell, and we never hit it. So everybody who sold at 48 made a fortune. Everyone who was holding for 50 made nothing. So don't get all set up on these round numbers. Sell when you feel like selling. I don't know. Or don't, whatever. Gabe, your opinion on the Ethereum price rise. Are you still with us? I think that somebody in the um, from the Ethereum subreddit has hacked Gabriel. So uh, you know we will. That's end correct. That, that's what that is what happened. That, that, yeah, oh, just gets back. I caught him off with my crazy hacker skills. Um, the bubble is not over. I think we're headed up, and when it pops, I think we're going to be lower than we are today. What is the price right now, anyways? It's about six dollars a coin. Yeah, we're going to go higher, and then we'll crash down much lower than today. Oh, my, my, my. I have no idea. All I can tell you is do the opposite of whatever I do. Moving on, issue four, worldwide economic collapse. Oil has fallen below $30 a barrel, and gas stations in California are now selling gas for less than $2 a gallon, a sight not seen since most of us were in grade school. The Dow has dropped hundreds of points multiple times this year, following the Chinese stock market downwards. Gabriel, is this it? Total economic collapse, or yet another boom and bust recession? I think it's the truth is somewhere between those two. Um, and this is, I'm not an economist, you know, Tone's probably going to have more cogent analysis, but then again, he's a trader and he thinks day to day. I'm thinking more on the years level. Um, Schiff is a perma bear, so not really, uh, the thing is, you know, he's a perma bear. So yes, he's right at those points when the market goes into a bear phase. That's where we're at now. Uh, the cracks happened in August and we've been in a hold, we were in a holding pattern in the fall as, um, you know, people who wanted to delay things even more, tried to keep the can and supported markets and did as much as they could until they couldn't. And that's now, this year so far. I think this is just the beginning of a massive financial um, crisis and panic and um, I will say um, price collapses. Not necessarily market collapses yet. The market collapses, will, in my prediction, won't happen until the currency collapses. And that's going to take a bit longer. And I think Tone was um, referring to that in the pre- show conversation a little bit. Um, this isn't the end, but I do feel that this is the beginning of the end for the current financial paradigm. It's going to take many years, and this is, it'll be really great to see people turn to Bitcoin in the, just the next couple, three, four years um, as the currencies around the world drop like flies. I think um, I'm very, very certain that this is the beginning of the end of the fractional reserve banking paradigm. It's going to take another, you know, maybe a couple, that short amount of decades. That's my prediction. Very dramatic. Tone vase. Oh, can you guys hear me? Okay. So, um, yeah, you're right, Gabe. I am a trader, but I'm not a day trader, per se. And uh, I am more, I do look out uh, months and years out as well. And uh, I find Peter Schiff really frustrating because of the perma bear situation, like you mentioned. Um, I agree with, the, with, with his analysis, but I usually disagree completely with his conclusions. And uh, the fact that he 
talks about gold and then sells gold drives me nuts. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very bad. Come on, him. wait a second, Tone. He's a, he has a gold company. He sells it. He makes a ton. He's not selling his personal gold. He's co he's got most of his savings in gold and silver. I bet. So it's not like he's trying to get rid of gold. He has he's a gold broker. He buys it and he sells it for you know point five percent more. That's not. Yeah, no, 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 that's fine, right? If you're gonna be a gold broker, be a gold broker. But he has such a he has a public profile that he's a market expert, and his expertise is gold's gonna go up, so buy it from my from my oh, yeah. broker company. Huge conflict of interest, and also in his opinion about Bitcoin too. He's real anti Bitcoin. Gee, I wonder why. I mean, Bitcoin right. is gonna eat gold's lunch eventually. It, it will. It absolutely will. And I have presentations talking about why that is. Um, so as far as the economy, I don't think this is the end. Um, I do think there are a lot of problems. To me, the problems begin and end with Europe. Uh, I think Europe is where the the real problems are, and uh, and pretty soon when Europe actually collapses, uh, it's just taking longer than expected. Uh, well, it's the, the Schengen zone is already out. The what? The, the Schengen zone of the EU. The borders are closing. Austria just closed its borders today. Oh, today? I thought they did that months ago. No, I, I've been talking about that for six months. I mean, again, I hope there's videos of this. Uh, when I, I talked about Greek banks failing and shutting down and money confiscating like six months before that happened, um, my, Italy is next for me. Oh, no, the borders are done. I mean, the moment they opened it up to the migrant crisis, that's the, that's the final nail in their coffin. Uh, they're done. I think the, the euro finally made its final high of uh, 1.14 just the other day. And I think that's over. I think we're going to parity with the dollar. Um, so, so here's the thing. I don't see like the world collapsing like some people do. I mean, they would love it for gold. Um, I do see major problems in Europe. And people in Europe still have money. Not everyone has been, you know, bitten by the socialist communist bug over there. So some people still have money. And that money will need to go somewhere. And every paper currency in the world is a complete disaster. Except one. Except the US dollar. And it doesn't matter how much QE there is. It doesn't matter how much the Fed prints. The Fed is printing for the whole world. The Fed is not printing for America. When the Fed prints, it moves through the entire world. And they just can't print fast enough. I don't want them printing. I don't want them bailing out. Um, but again, my views are very, very different than the standard person. I actually like fractional reserve lending. I think it's necessary. My problem is always government. Uh, I'm okay with fractional reserve lending. You want to create money out of uh, 10 to 1 uh, out of thin air and lend it to a business that you think can create jobs and, and have a good idea? Great. Do it. But guess what? Government doesn't create jobs. It only takes away jobs. All they do is consume, they don't produce. So the fact that government gets to create money out of thin air for themselves is, I think, what's causing this giant mess. Uh, but the U.S. dollar is still the strongest currency in the world. It will remain that way. I think it will only get stronger. Uh, the U.S. economy will falter when the U.S. dollar gets too strong. I don't know, maybe double its value from today. Um, so I think the U.S. stock market will do well. I think government bonds are going to do terrible. Now that the interest rates are going negative, no, who's going to want to invest in bonds? Who's going to want to buy a bond? Uh, the S&P 500, I believe, is near the bottom. Once the S&P 500 turns around and starts to go up, we're going to see the S&P 500 go like Ethereum. Uh, that's going to be that's, that's going to be my new go-to asset now for uh, for parabolic and exponential rises. Um, and when the market starts to go up again, everyone's going to dump their bonds and put it in the market. Uh, I, I don't think this is the end. And another reason why I don't think this is the end is because there's too many people screaming it's the end. In 2007, people were saying real estate prices were, were going to go to like your, your rinky-dink house uh, of like two bedrooms going to be worth like $3 million. Um, it's when everyone starts screaming it can only go up. That's when it goes down. It's just a scare. Stock market will do fine. Europe will collapse. The U.S. government bonds will do poorly. Uh, gold will probably, I don't think gold bottomed yet, uh, but I think the stock market will be fine. Uh, oh, and we have a whole show for that. Uh, catch us on the World Crypto Network. Uh, it's called Bitcoin Technical Analysis, but there might be some rebranding in the near future. I don't want to give too much away here. All right, yeah, talk to you good. guys. I just want to say, uh, Tone, you're totally wrong. Don't you know the dollar is going to collapse tomorrow? And ladies and gentlemen, you can buy a World Crypto Network silver coin right <laughs> now. You just, just send your 0.1 Bitcoin in. You can get your silver rounds because, you know, the world is going to collapse. You, you saw it in the title, ladies and gentlemen. WCN silver is the way to go. The dollar is going to collapse. But yeah, that's Wait, just no, kind of... Idea. Is there actually a branded silver coin for the World Crypto Network? No, unfortunately not. No, oh, actually, uh, I, 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 it, yeah, I know. We, we could do that. No, actually, um, it is kind of... Funny because, um, okay, on the one hand, I totally agree with you. What this is what happens with, you know, maybe what is it? What does it say? A broken record uh, sounds good once every ten years or, or whatever. I mean, if I say every week on the Bitcoin group the dollar is going to collapse, well, I might be right one sometimes, but most of the time I won't be. But if it just happens to be my business is to tell you the dollar is going to collapse because you need to buy cool rocks that shine really cool that you can look at, then you know I might do that more often. So what? I, <laughs> but on the other hand. It's not that I'm against, um, you know, I'm, so this is my wallet, and in my wallet every day I've got uh, one ounce of silver, you know, with me. So I do carry silver with me. I, I guess I'm a gold bug or something, I guess. I don't know if that makes me a gold bug. You know, maybe I'm a little bit of a freak. You know, I got my, uh, you know, my survival card. I'm ready to go. I'm ready for the real collapse. I'm not any of this bullshit right now. This is nothing. This is just like playing, you know. We're not in collapse. This is just like fooling around. So I'm ready. So bring it. You know, if you're really ready for a collapse, then, you know, you better bring it because I'm ready. 
And uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I think um, your tone brings on some good points. I guess he's kind of convinced me a little. But yeah, if you look at the charts and you just don't listen to all the hype, um, yeah, S and P could could really bounce here. And uh, you know, Europe Europe looks pretty crappy. DAX is going to really major lows, which is the German stock market, and that represents a lot of the economy because that's the biggest economy. So I don't know. Let's see what happens um, as far as gold and silver. I still think um, I guess I'm more optimistic than tone. Although I am kind of hesitant because we didn't get triple digit, you know, so it's kind of like you kind of need to visit, dip your toe in that water. But I don't know. I think maybe people are panicked enough just to buy it, you know, at this point. Um, host Thomas, what's the question? I still think the, the phrase of the day is it's going to go up like Ethereum. I like that. It's going to go up like Ethereum. It could go up like Ethereum, S&P. Um, I'm hesitant about that, but I like a short term bounce, definitely. Um, and uh, definitely contrary to what, you know, all the panic is everyone's saying. But yeah, the European side looks pretty bad, and you have the opposite in the media. Uh, it's, and I, I it's do not think, so bad. It's not so bad. Everything is pretty good. I do think we're running out of time, so let's move to the exit question. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 meaning zip, 0, butt kiss, and 10 being absolute, metaphysical, catastrophe, how bad is the current economic situation? Gabriel. 5. Tone. I'm gonna I'm gonna split Gabe's answer. In the U.S., it's like a two, and in Europe, it's like an eight, and Asia's in between. Well, Google Google did a great job on this new Hangouts. It's broken twice for me this show. Tone, did we get a number from you? Oh, can you guys hear me now? Yep, yeah, go ahead. Yes. I, oh, okay. sorry. I said, uh, I guess my mute never turned off. Um, wait, can you guys hear me or not? Yes. Yes, we can. Wow, because it's still so that I'm mute. Okay, this is weird. Anyway. Uh, I'm going to split Gabe's answer. Um, it's a disaster in Europe, so I give it an 8. It's okay in the U.S., so I give it a 2. And I'll put Asia in between, so like a 5. There's a lot of numbers. Theo Goodman. Well, it was about what I'm willing to give up, right? And, uh, you know, in the optimal world, of course, 0 would be what I would like to give up. But, of course, you know, everyone has to compromise, so 1 or 2 is possible. The correct answer is 4. The correct answer is 4. Moving on to predictions or story of the week. Gabriel, do you have a prediction or a story of the week? Yes, uh, my story of the week is that I read a Medium post uh, about Bitcoin consensus and uh, among, sort of among the developers. Um, and it sounds like the, uh, the tone of the debate between the Bitcoin core and the Bitcoin classic people who want to have a hard fork and move straight to 2 megabyte and also some sort of democratic software thing that isn't well defined. Um, the Medium post I read, I'm trying to remember who wrote it, but um, it, uh, it, it talked about sort of you know, the roadmap and how actually the two sides are are hardly even that far from each other at this point, uh, and that they, the core developers actually do want to move to 2 megabyte eventually, as long as it's done in a uh, clear way that, that they can get consensus for. So my word of the week is anti-fragile. It's very clear to me that all this drama has merely crystallized and clarified the mission of the Bitcoin ecosystem in moving forward with a secure platform. Anti-fragile. Tone base. So my, I guess my long, I don't have anything short term, so my longer term prediction is that governments are going to start to see Bitcoin as being hostile uh, because now we have all these other projects like Ethereum, like R3Sev that are pushing, uh, trying to push Bitcoin out because of its, uh, I guess, bad image. And people even on Twitter are, like sneaking into the tweets when I was uh, debating them over Ethereum and they're like, well, Ethereum tokens don't come with the, bit the stigma of the Bitcoin token. Um, so again, the whole system is turning political and um, I think there's going to be like a, wa or a sudden wave of why Bitcoin is bad and uh, there's going to be attempts at legislation against Bitcoin. And of course, it's not going to work because if it worked, uh, Bitcoin would or the speculation would already drive Bitcoin price down to the ground. Uh, it was created to be censorship resistant. And uh, I, I welcome the challenge. Let's put it that way. And I see this battle coming uh, towards the middle or end of the year. Theo Goodman. Uh, I've got, a, of course, a combo story and prediction of the week. And that would the story of the week that you might not think is Bitcoin related is that DraftKings bought CounterMove. And CounterMove is the MMA fantasy equivalent to DraftKings. Now, DraftKings has had, at the end of the football season, trouble with their payment processor that said they're not going to service any more fantasy players. And DraftKings is still expanding. So, I don't know, I think that's a good move. And my prediction related to that is that someone in that fantasy space, whether it's their competitor, uh, Draft Duel, or any of the other, maybe there's some smaller ones in that space that one of them in the near future is going to get on the Bitcoin train because they're going to have trouble with their payment processors. And it's going to have to do with what some of everyone has said about, you know, uh, freedom of speech, you know, and all that kind of stuff and, you know, Reg Arb for life and so on. Very good. And now, instead of a prediction, a statement. 
I'm very proud of how the Bitcoin community behaved this week when we asked you to help our friend Chris Ellis. We started out with no money, and as you know, Chris, he doesn't want to ask for help, and we ended up with a lot of money and a real fighting chance to find out what's wrong with Chris and get it fixed. And it's all because of you, and I thank you. And we're still accepting donations over at saveellis.org. If you want to go and scan the QR code right now, or you could just visit saveellis.org. And this is just a great thing to help our friend. Uh, we raised $4,483.23. Had a couple of donations coming in still recently. Uh, it doesn't have to be a large donation. Could be a small donation. Every little bit helps. And I just, I really appreciate everyone uh, chipping in to help out Chris. It's been really nice. And uh, that's about it. We went on very long today, but thanks everyone for sticking with us. And we're out of time. Until next time. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>